Hello everyone, this is Shannon from Not So Poe, and today I am doing my favorites of 2019. I am so excited to talk about these books. I read so many amazing books in 2019. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a bunch of different books in different categories. So I'm gonna give you my top three in various categories that I read in this year. I thought about narrowing it down to like, oh, top 10 of the year. There's no way I can do that. I read over 70 books that I gave five stars to this year. So it's just, it's just not going to happen, but I will try to be brief so that it doesn't go on forever. Um, these books are generally books that I gave five stars to, although a couple of them were four and a half stars in that there was something that maybe I didn't think was perfect about the book, but really stuck with me, really impacted me and just are the books that I kind of think I would recommend. So, Let's get into it. I have quite a few different categories and books that I wanna talk about, but really, I loved all of these books and I highly recommend you pick up any of them that sound interesting to you. So the first category is nonfiction. The first book that was a favorite is Uncanny Magazine, issue 24, Disabled People Destroy Science Fiction by various authors. This is something that I did a standalone video talking all about, so if you wanna know more, you can go ahead and look in the description box below and I'll link that video. Basically, half of this collection actually is fiction, um, short stories that are science fiction, but the second half is a bunch of nonfiction essays by science fiction authors talking about how science fiction represents disabled characters and what they would like to see and sort of the kind of strength and purpose of literature in creating new worlds that imagine new realities for people. It is absolutely stunning and I think really great to read, especially if you like science fiction and you want to know more about kind of the disabled experience. So I thought that was fantastic, even though, you know, not every short story, not every essay was perfect, which is why this one got four and a half out of five, but it was still so, so worthwhile. Next is Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. This is a book that looks at sort of the history of humanity and in particular tries to understand what is so special about Homo sapiens. What makes us kind of stand out and so effective as kind of a species. So in particular, he talks about our ability to communicate, our ability to cooperate, our ability to share belief systems and how that enables us to do things that are so much more than what just we as individual humans are capable of. I found it was just really, really thought provoking. I had so many ideas after this. It definitely shifted the way that I frame certain things and look at certain things and really also just talks about things like um, how so many of the beliefs that we have, they're just constructed. They're in a sense myth, um, even things like money and you know capitalism and all these sorts of things. So that was a very interesting perspective shift for me. The last book and my top of nonfiction for 2019 is Between the World and Me by ta Coates. This I thought was beautiful. It is a memoir that ta Coates writes to his son talking about his experiences growing up black in the inner city and then later becoming somebody who is on a world stage. He was an advisor in the White House and just um, is now a really strong writer. He has such beautiful lyrical writing. And what I found so powerful about this memoir was that insight that it offers into the way that growing up in a very difficult circumstance can shape your world view and can limit you in a lot of ways and how for so many people in the US that is kind of the reality of things even though it doesn't need to be and just that insight into kind of the black inner city male experience I thought was really really worthwhile and I'd highly recommend that everybody pick this up to gain that insight. Next, I'd like to talk about a couple of different graphic works categories. The first of these is children's picture books. I did not expect going into 2019 that this would be a category for me, but it very much was. I read so many amazing children's picture books. It is 
just fantastic how many great ones there are out there. So the first I'd like to talk about is Julian is a Mermaid by Jessica Love. This is such a sweet young children's picture book. It has very few words, mostly just pictures, but it's gorgeous. The artwork is fantastic and the story is really heartwarming. It's about a little boy, Julian, who loves to swim and who one day decides he needs to become a mermaid and so he dresses up as one. And this book is all about gender expression, about queerness, and about kind of family support of that as well. So I highly recommend this book even though it has maybe like 10 words total. It's so good. Next is Mary Who Wrote Frankenstein by Linda Bailey, illustrated by Julia Sarda. This is just fantastic artwork. I, I adore this. This is actually nonfiction. It is a biography of Mary Shelley. So it's all about her childhood and about the time when she sort of went on that retreat with, you know, all of the different authors and decided to write Frankenstein. Um, it offers really interesting insight into her childhood and background and sort of the influences she had, some of the rebellion, some of the fascinating things going on in science that period, but it's all done in a way that, uh, you know, maybe an eight or nine year old child would love reading about. The artwork though is what makes this really stand out. The artwork is gothic and fantastic and it's all done in these autumnal colors. I love this book and I'm totally getting myself a copy. The top one that I have for this year was Night Lights by Lorena Alvarez. This is sort of a fantastical story about a little girl who loves to draw. Um, and she finds herself sort of torn because she should be doing other things, homework and such, but drawing is where she finds her passion. And one day she starts making friends with another little girl who loves her artwork, but maybe has some ulterior motives. And this this story just goes into these kind of fantastical dream elements. Um, the little girl has all of these uh, dreams at night and creations and it's so beautifully drawn. The colors in this are so vivid, the shapes are so round and the characters and beautiful creatures that are created are just really fantastical. So I loved everything about this story, both the artwork and the exploration of being a creative person, being an artist and finding your calling and your strength and dealing with kind of how outside forces influence you. So these were all excellent picture books. The next category is middle grade and YA graphic works. So first in this is a manga called My Little Monster by Nobiko. This is basically a YA contemporary looking at the relationship between a girl and a guy where the girl is very, very hardworking and wants to be successful in life, but closed off, extremely closed off emotionally. She doesn't have friends. She doesn't have hobbies. All she does is study. And she comes in contact with a guy who who is super smart but has had a lot of family issues and has really developed become a little bit of a monster he scares other people he gets into fights a lot these sorts of things and they end up becoming friends and then falling in love a lot of this book focuses on kind of overcoming your own emotional issues, developing as a person, learning the importance of friendship and caring about others. And I think that the emotional journey in this made it really, really great. Also, it had a ton of comedy, a lot of things that I found very funny about it. The next is The Witch Boy by Molly Ostertag. This is a series that focuses on a boy, Aster, who it's kind of a modern day, but with magical elements, whose family lives in, on a kind of a secluded area and everybody in the family is either a witch if they're female or a shapeshifter if they're male. But Aster is not. He is very much male, but very much a witch. And he struggles with that because it's very much banned for any male to practice magic. Bad things have happened in the past. So he has to do it in secret and he struggles against the expectations and the restrictions and wants to make everybody happy, but also can't help but practice magic. So the this series is does a great job of exploring a lot of gender issues, also a lot of issues of friendship and of family dynamics. And I found it 
emotionally very rewarding as well as having beautiful artwork um very soft lines very sweet story and just such a great middle grade picture book not picture book graphic work um then the last one my top one is the prince and the dressmaker by jen wong this is just the sweetest, most joyful story. It is about a prince, sort of in a turn of the century Paris-like city, who loves to dress up as um, Lady Cristalia. So at night he'll go in drag and wear these gorgeous gowns and wigs and everything like that, but it's very much a secret because he's worried that that won't be accepted. He has all of these princely duties and responsibilities that weigh very, very heavily on him. And he makes friends with a dressmaker who creates all of his beautiful gowns for the evening and they become very very close but there's a tension there because she wants to be a famous dressmaker but he needs to keep the secret about where his dresses are made so there's a lot of difficulty there with kind of coming out um, and fear of what the consequences will be I thought that the story was really sweet and the artwork and the dresses it's it's this beautiful kind of haute couture mixed with um, kind of that turn of the century style it's fantastic artwork and a lovely story that I thought was really wonderful so all three of these were very much my style Next is adult comics. The first of these I'd like to talk about is the Mouse series by Arch Spiegelman. This is a classic in terms of graphic works that are very much meant for adults. It is a memoir of Arch Spiegelman and his father. His father went through the Holocaust and it's about sort of both what happened in the Holocaust which is an amazing story. It's very heart-wrenching, so much trauma, as well as what his father and his life were like afterwards, um, many years later, when he was growing up and, and being an adult. And it just delves into a lot about what the Holocaust was, what happened with it, as well as that kind of trauma that comes with it and how that affects future generations. So this is a classic for a reason. It is very, very strong. Next on my list is the Monstrous series by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. The Monstrous series is really some of the most gorgeous artwork I have ever seen. It is lush and beautiful, this almost steampunk Asian fantasy epic story that has a strong cast of almost all women that are dealing with huge issues of politics and world power and magic and ancient gods and there's political intrigue so it is a very very epic story it's a bit graphic there's quite a lot of violence and war in it um, and it deals a lot also with trauma and um, kind of issues between families things like that so it's, it's a bit of a heavy series but it is the most stunning artwork and just really fascinating to read through. And my top one is Nimona by Noelle Stevenson. Uh, Nimona is something that I only read somewhat recently, but it was fantastic. I loved the quirky art style. I loved the comedy of it. It's just hilarious. I love Nimona as a character. She is this uh, apprentice basically to an evil scientist and she all she wants to do is go out and destroy things she's like can we burn it down can we go kill those people and she's just so joyful and excited about all of this she's kind of uh, a walking wrecking ball and I loved the way that this comic not only did so much fun humor but also explored a lot of really interesting themes of friendship and loyalty of what makes somebody a good person what makes somebody a bad person and how you support those who are your friends and who are around you. So it was heartwarming, it was funny, it was fun, and I also just loved kind of the cute aspect of the, the drawing style. It was very quirky and fun. So all of these I really loved. Now moving on to my favorite short story collections of 2019. The first is a collection of literary short stories called Sabrina y Corina by Kali Fajardo Anstein. These short stories are set in Colorado in modern day and they're about all of these indigenous Latina women. Uh, the book is really a collection of stories about a community. So it's about all of these women, about their relationships with each other, their mothers and daughters and sisters and grandmothers. It's about that connection to family, but 
also the frustrations of your family. It's about generational trauma. It's about being stuck in a situation and unable to get out of it. It's about wanting more for the future than you have. And I found it really powerful. It is definitely um, a bit melancholy. It is definitely something that has some weight to it, but I thought that the stories were beautiful and I loved the themes that it explored. Next is Jackalope Wives and Other Stories by Teen Kingfisher. This is really fantastic. So these short stories are a lot of fantasy, things about witches and magic, and most of the stories feature women who are like middle-aged or old, and I love that. I love stories that are about women, especially older women, and almost none of these had any romance in them. I'm not sure that any had romance in them, actually. It was just really about the women and their power and their magic and the way that um, often they're sort of neglected by everybody else, but they have so much to offer. I really liked these stories. I really liked the kind of feminist fantasy bent of them, and there was so much humor. So. I got a lot out of it. Um, the last, but also more than one, um, the favorite of the year is the Ted Chang short story collections, uh, stories of your life and others, as well as exhalation. So I'm just kind of sl slipping in two for this because they're both so good. They are so, so good. So this is my first time reading Ted Chang and wow, absolutely amazing. I did do separate uh, discussion videos of both of these collections, so I will link those down below if you want to hear more about the individual stories. But overall, both of these collections had such an excellent focus on speculative fiction. I think that's where Ted Chang is so strong in creating these stories that take a premise and really follow it through and say, okay, well, what if we did have this development or what if the world was different in this way? How would that change society? How would that change the way that we interact? So there are very contemplative, very philosophical explorations of different speculative ideas focused often on science fiction. So I highly recommend both of these short story collections. Um, if you have heard of the movie Arrival, uh, that is based on one of the stories called Story of Your Life, and it's just a fantastic movie as well. Next, I'd like to talk about my favorite poetry collections of 2019. First is If They Come For Us by Fatima Asghar. This collection looks at Asghar's identity a lot, especially as sort of um, a Pakistani American queer woman and also takes a look at sort of the history of the Pakistan-India divide and a lot of the sort of generational trauma, uh, maybe this is a theme of stuff that I like, um, that goes throughout that. So it's really interesting. She especially does a good job of looking at kind of both that desire to be connected to her cultural heritage as well as frustration with not fitting in with it. Um, she has some really great things looking as well at sort of the microaggressions and issues of being a Pakistani American and what all of that means. So it's, it's definitely a political and um, important collection of poetry that I think is well worth reading. Next is Citizen Illegal by Jose Olivares. This is again very political looking at identity. Um, this book looks at being Latinx in the US, looks at that connection to your heritage, looks at sort of Olivares's desire to sort of be connected to his Mexican heritage, but also his differences and, and distinctions from his parents and his kind of new way of being as Mexican American. So it really examines a lot of that. Also looks at a lot of things that are political, especially the way that Mexican Americans are treated in the US. So lots of politics, lots of identity, and lots of really interesting themes. The last one, I think I have a theme in this, is American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin by Terence Hayes. This is also political looking at identity. So Terence Hayes wrote a bunch of sonnets after Trump was elected, um, really talking about sort of the experience of being a black man in the US and about the difficulties when sort of the society around you decides to 
um, elect somebody who is very much against sort of what your community stands for, that frustration, that anger, that feeling of um, being under threat. And it's a very powerful collection for all of those emotions. The next category is novels in verse. And yes, I have a category for novels in verse because apparently I read quite a few of them and really, really loved them. So it is a category for me. Um, the first of these is Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. This was fantastic. It's a YA about a teenage boy who lives in a sort of dangerous neighborhood and his older brother is killed in some gang violence. And he decides to grab his brother's gun and go down and shoot the people who are responsible. But as he's in the elevator ride down, it sort of gets stuck and he has to examine a lot of his thoughts, a lot of his past trauma, a lot of the sort of reasons why this kind of cycle of violence happens and just really come to terms with a lot of important things in his community. And I thought that that exploration of his personal journey, as well as a look at these sort of social issues involved in a lot of black communities was really powerful. Plus the language was beautiful. Jason Reynolds is just the most fantastic writer I love. I love, love, love his prose. It's beautiful. Next is Lion Island by Margarita Engel. This is a fantastic book that looks at it's a historical fiction, but based very heavily in history, looks at um, a Chinese Cuban boy in the 1800s who worked through writing for the, for the purpose of promoting the emancipation of both Chinese kind of slave laborers as well as actual African descended slaves in Cuba. Um, and it tells the story of him as well as some of his friends and the work that each of them does trying to fight for justice, trying to fight for equality. Um, and this is based on real history, although it's a fictionalized account. And it's all told in verse from their three perspectives, his and his two friends. And it's just beautiful. I loved the poetry. I loved the history. I loved the political activism. It was excellent. And top on my list for novels in verse, unsurprisingly, is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo, which if you've been on booktube, you've heard of this book. It's just as good as everybody says it is. It is a story about a teenage girl, Shiomara, who is struggling to find her place. She is growing up in a very conservative religious household and is constantly silenced, but finds her voice through her journaling in poetry and through joining a slam poetry club at school and performing and expressing all of those emotions and frustrations. And just that finding her voice and empowerment of this teenage girl was wonderful. Plus I listened to the audiobook of this, which I highly recommend and the author reads it herself. It is so, so powerful. Okay, just a few more categories now. Next is middle grade. I discovered a true, deep, and abiding love of middle grade this year, and I read some excellent ones. First is Hurricane Child by Kaysen Callender. This is a story of a little girl growing up in the Caribbean whose mother uh, disappears, and she's been gone for a year, and the girl is so so frustrated and misses her mother so much and she doesn't fit in at school and she is constantly bullied and just so angry about the situation but also so determined to change it she wants to find her mother she wants to you know make sure that she does the things that she needs to do and at the same time there's a new girl in school that she becomes friends with and more than friends she falls in love with um, this other girl but she has to deal with sort of the consequences of how other people react to that relationship. I loved the strength of the main character. I loved the emotions and the power. And also there's a bunch of magic that is in this story. Um, she can see some magical ghosts and things around and it's just such a beautiful atmospheric story. Next is Coraline by Neil Gaiman. Um, I had seen the movie of this years ago, but this was the first time I had read the book. And similarly, it deals with a, a young girl who is very stubborn, who wants to do things her way, um, and it has this dark magic to it. So in Coraline, um, she and her parents move to 
a, a house out in the countryside and there are funky things going on where there is a door that leads to a brick wall except that one day Coraline opens it and it leads to kind of an alternate world that is her house as well and she has an other mother who has buttons for eyes and is actually kind of scary um, and wants some things from Coraline. So I love the creepy horror aspect of this, but in a middle grade way so I could handle it. I, I just thought it was beautiful writing as often is the case because I love Gaiman's writing in general and it was just such a cool story. Uh, my top middle grade of the year is A Dash of Trouble by Ana Mariano. This is um, a really cute series called the Love Sugar Magic series, and it's all about, uh, again, a little girl who is very stubborn, who discovers that her family are brujas and they can bake magic, but she's the youngest of all of her sisters and she's excluded from all of this. She does not want to be excluded though, so she kind of goes around their backs and does some magic and things go a little wrong. <laughs> so it's got a lot of humor, it's got a lot of focus on family, it's got a lot of cultural aspects because they are Latina and it's just so beautiful and so much fun and so atmospheric. I had such a fun time with this and I'm really excited because the third book in the series is going to be coming out soon, so I can't wait to get my hands on that one. Next is Romance. First on my list here is Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. If you've been around Booktube, you've heard of this book because it is such a favorite of so many people for good reason. This book is so much fun. It's a contemporary, has so much humor, is very irreverent, a bit of swearing, um, and it's about the this first son of the United States whose mother is president. He is a Latinx and he has some altercations with one of the princes in Britain. Uh, the government say, hey, you guys gotta fix this up, and so they have to form a friendship that actually turns into a real friendship and real connection, and then later into love. Um, their story, that kind of progression, also them dealing with very different personalities and very different stressors while also having a lot of commonalities was really great to read about, as well as just all of the politics that were very timely. Um, it's a beautiful queer romance and I highly recommend reading this one if you want a good romp. Next on my list is A Very Large Expanse of Sea by Tahara Mafi. This is also a YA contemporary, although I would say it focuses not just on the romance, but also especially on the experience of the main character, who is a Muslim American girl. And all of the kind of difficulties that she has faced with being Muslim, with wearing a hijab, with dealing with all of that stuff, because the book takes place right after 9-11, a year after 9-11. Um, she falls in love with this kind of all-American boy who just doesn't understand that she's going to face any problems, and their relationship does cause a lot of problems for their kind of conservative community. He's brought to realize all of these things that he didn't understand um, and she's able to work through some of that anger and some of that fear and learn to just say, hey, this is who I am and I'm going to still form relationships and have connections even if some people are just awful in this world. So lots of politics in this one as well, but a really beautiful love story that I enjoyed quite a lot. My top romance uh, is Get a Life, Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. I did do a separate video about this, so I will link that down below. And this book was just so much everything that I want in a romance. It's so sweet and so cute and funny, and it's got such a great relationship that really focuses on consent and compassion and understanding. It explores a tension not between so much the characters fighting, but between their own issues, causing them to struggle to connect. So the main character, Chloe, has chronic pain, and this has led to a lot of difficulties in her life, especially with being able to connect with other people. Uh, the main male lead, Red, is dealing with getting over the trauma of a past emotionally abusive relationship and so just watching them overcoming their own emotional hurdles and finding their way and strength together was really beautiful plus it was just such a fun read i loved it now for the second to last category fantasy also i do want to apologize for the lighting the sun keeps coming in and out between the clouds and that is messing with my camera's ability to handle the lighting so 
Sorry, but I'm gonna keep going. So for fantasy, the first book I wanna talk about is The Deep by Rivers Solomon. This is a novella that came out towards the end of 2019 and has some really interesting deep themes about generational trauma and about the burden of history. So in this story, there are a community of mer people, and these mer people are the descendants of pregnant African women who were captured by slavers and then thrown overboard only for their babies to be born in the water, sort of as mer people. These Mer people have such a traumatic history and past that it was found to be too much of a burden for them to hold. So instead, there is one member of the community, the historian, who holds all of those traumatic memories and once a year will share that memory in order for people to feel connection to their past in a remembrance which lasts a couple of days. The current historian Yetu is really struggling with the burden of all of those memories because they are so traumatic and so heavy and she's just finding herself unable to cope. So the story is really about her trying to balance her need for safety and survival and determining sort of what happens to herself with also her obligation to her community. And it's a really interesting discussion and story. I, I absolutely loved it. The next book is The Black God's Drums by P. Jelly Clark. This is such a fun novella. It is set in New Orleans in the kind of mid 1800s in an alternate history version of the US. Um, and in this alternate history, New Orleans becomes an independent city state that is very powerful. Um, and it is really fascinating, this way of reworking history and empowering the people of New Orleans. Also Haiti, is a powerful independent nation that has a lot of magic. They have these gods that are from Africa that have come over and supported them. And the story follows Creeper, who is a 13 year old girl who's super smart. She's very street smart. She is somebody who gets by by sort of connecting people, selling information, getting people what they need. And she discovers that there's some sort of plot going on and she wants to sell some of that information to a Haitian airship captain and she gets involved in this. Uh, also, Creeper inhabits one of those um, goddesses herself. So she has a goddess inside of her who often takes control. So there's so many interesting, fascinating, magical and steampunk elements of this story. Plus it was just a fun mystery. I really loved reading it. The top uh, fantasy book that I read this year was Gods of Jade and Shadow by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Again, this is something that has been very popular on booktube and for good reason. I loved this book. It is the story of Cassiopeia, who is sort of a poor relation that lives with her rich grandfather in the kind of late 1920s in Mexico. And she's treated kind of like a Cinderella character very poorly until one day she discovers the bones of a Mayan death god and through her blood, through her flesh, accidentally revives him. And then she has to help him because he is now on a quest to regain some missing items in order to get his throne back from his evil twin brother who dethroned him and took over. And the story follows them on this road trip quest where they go to all different parts of Mexico. It's filled with different little snippets of all of these cities in that jazz age era and it also shows so many different aspects of mayan mythology each place that they go they have to interact with ghosts and demons and witches and magicians all these sorts of things until finally they actually have to go to the underworld to shabalba and I loved the way that the mythology was all integrated and so beautiful and atmospheric in this story. Plus, I love the development of Cassiopeia's character. She starts out as a very Cinderella type character, but that is not how she ends up. She ends up empowered and strengthened and somebody who not only takes control of her life, but also becomes very adult in terms of understanding what her responsibilities are, understanding how to take the high road, how to overcome past grievances, and how to create the kind of life she wants to lead. So I loved this book. And now for my last category, science fiction. I read so many amazing science fiction books this year. It blew me away. Um, fantasy is definitely my go-to genre, but this year I think I had many more science fiction books that really stuck with me. 
I loved so many things that I had such a hard time just narrowing it down to three. And in fact, I failed. I'm actually gonna talk about four books because I really couldn't narrow it down further. So many great books. So the first one that I wanna talk about is the Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. This won Hugo Awards for every book in the series and it makes sense. It is a fantastic series. This series really both has excellent world building as well as sort of character development and interpersonal relationships and a lot of political and social justice themes. It's really an impactful series that I highly recommend to everybody. The story follows a world where there has been sort of a, an apocalypse in a sense in that the world has a lot of ecological disasters that happen frequently, huge huge earthquakes and volcanoes and all these sorts of things that make life very very difficult to sustain and this has been going on for a very long time uh, humanity has tried to adapt but it's become very very broken down in a typical post-apocalyptic situation but what's really hard is that they have these fifth seasons which are extended winters so for 20, 40, 100 years winter. And it's very difficult for humanity to survive and it's kind of eroded a lot of the humanity really of all of these communities. Also, the main characters of the book are something called orogenes. And orogenes are a very low caste of people. They have a lot of power because they can manipulate the earth, they can calm earthquake tremors, these sorts of things, but they're very, very feared and very controlled and often abused. And the story follows some origins as they work through this fifth season that is currently happening that is much worse than all the previous ones and humanity may not survive. So it's very epic and grand, but also really deals with a lot of issues of the injustices of the way that the society is set up, as well as many really fascinating interpretations personal relationships. N.K. Jemisin, I think, was a psychologist before she became a writer, and it clearly shows that she works a lot on the development of her character's emotional and mental state. So I loved everything about the series. It is very heavy, but I highly recommend it. Next is another very heavy book, which is An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. This is about a generation starship where all of humanity has been trying to find a new home. And this generation starship is sort of set up like the Antebellas in the South, where each level of the starship, A through Z, is for a different cast of people. So the white rich people are in A, and the black basically slave-like people are in Z. So this starship has a lot of major social injustices, and we follow the main character, Aster, who is non-binary, autistic, um, black and is also very intelligent, is a doctor and a scientist. And they are trying to basically get on with their life, but also become very motivated to fight against some of the social injustices in the system of the starship through trying to follow some mystery that has to do with their mother. I loved the mystery aspects of this. I love the social justice aspects of it. I love the representation of non-binary, of autistic, of so many things. Also, this book deals with so much generational trauma and really deep topics. I thought it was an excellent exploration of them. Next on my list is Semiosis by Sue Burke. This is a very slow and contemplative and philosophical novel that looks at sort of what humanity can be. So in it, there is a colony of people who leave Earth and go to a new planet called Pax. They create an idealistic society based on peace and cooperation. And it follows those colonists over many generations. So each kind of section of the book is told from the perspective of a different colonist of a different generation. We see how those colonists change and adapt to their new home. Pax is a very different planet from Earth in that it does have a lot of plant and animal life, but it is a much older world and the plant life is much more evolved and in fact sentient. But it takes a while for them to understand what's going on both for them to understand and for the plants to understand 
what these new animals are. So a lot of the story is really about them figuring out how to cooperate and how to understand one another, how to communicate, and really how to grow from their differences, how to learn from each other and become better rather than you know devolve into pettiness and fighting. And a lot of this book really looks at what are our base natures and what are our better natures and can we become better over time? What is our potential? So this book is really thought provoking and just so wonderful to sit with and think about. I thought it provoked a lot of reflection and I really enjoyed it. Plus it, a lot of it is about language and communication, which is a theme that I really like. Speaking of which, the other book that I could not leave off this list is also about language and communication, and that is Babel 17 by Samuel R. Delaney. So this book really, really worked for me, although I know that it doesn't work for everybody because the second half of the book can get a little confusing. The main premise of this story is that there is a poet who is also a, an amazing code breaker, Rydra Wong. And she is employed by her planet's government to sort of crack the code of this mysterious Babel 17 language that they've been inter uh, intercepting messages in that the enemy kind of empire has been using. So she starts analyzing this language and quickly discovers that she needs to go and do some field research. So she puts together a team of people to be her spaceship crew. And these this team is kind of like sailors in that, you know, they are of a lower class and she has to go to the docks to kind of get them. And instead of tattoos, they have like body modifications, things like wings and horns and all sorts of stuff. Um, and this diversity of her crew is fascinating. There's um, all sorts of different types of relationships and people, people who are discorporate, so they have no physical body. It's really fascinating, the world building in this. And that part of gathering her spaceship community, her crew is really fascinating. So all of that's great. I think the second half of the book can be harder for other people, but I really loved it. So what happens is this story is all about this mystery of her unraveling, uncovering what's going on with Babel 17. There's a lot going on, a lot of um, crazy things, a lot of intrigue, and the way that it unfolds is really fascinating, especially with the role that language plays in this for the language Babel 17. So I loved this book. It really, really worked for me. I think I also just like space mysteries. Um, so it, it ended up being a real favorite of mine. So that wraps up my favorites of 2019. I know this was a lot of books. I tried to go as quickly as I could, but I really couldn't leave these out. I just, I had so many wonderful books that I read this year that I wanted to share. Um, if you guys have read any of these books, please let me know down in the comments what you thought, if any of these are ones that you want to read now, or if you have any other recommendations for me based on what I've talked about, I really want to hear your thoughts. I've been loving watching other people's wrap ups of of their favorites of 2019 as well. So if you have one out and I haven't already commented, let me know. I wanna hear and see everybody's favorites for the year.